We're super excited you're here. Uh, so um, I'm going to do an intro for an intro, but before I introduce, so uh, I met Ari through Jennifer Ridner, um, who is going to come up and introduce her. But before I do, where, wherever you are, um, we're really excited to have you as the final uh, presenter for our fall 2019 uh, speaker series. Uh, Ari is like all the things that you want to be, I think. She's an artist. I'll put these in order. Artist first, technologist, designer, activist, event organizer. Um, DJ. Oh, well, I didn't know about that. All right, we'll save it for you. Um, so we're so excited to have you because this is the kind of hybrid person um, that we love to have here and that we actually try and cultivate here. So we're so excited. I'm so excited to meet you today in person. And now to introduce Ari is Jennifer Rittner, who you also know. Welcome to Jennifer. So I to, this is completely spontaneous because I did not realize that this was happening today and I literally just came upstairs from my office so that I could come and say hi to Ari. So in this semester, I feel like my mandate has been to talk about design and social cohesion and the ways in which we create spaces for people to find their best places of belonging. And Ari really represents that for me and what she's done in Afrodictopia. So a couple of years ago, across my screen passed this word, Afrodictopia at ITP, at NYU, it's like all the things that you go, I, I just want to know what that is. And um, I knew that I had to attend. I walked into that space, and when I talk to you about making spaces for all of your intersectional weirdness, that is the space that you want to make. Because people who were there were bringing their full selves there. They were... Um, loving their artistic, creative, technological, nerdy, special, unique spaces and selves in a place of belonging. And for most and many of the people who were there, being the only is actually their normal state of being. Looking around them in spaces and going, I'm kind of the only one, that's the norm. So to create a space where there was real community and cohesion, but still a sense of independence and, and creative vibrancy and uniqueness. That is that is really incredible. So uh, Ari, I'm sure, is going to tell you all about what it meant for her to create her thesis project, which has now taken a life of its own. People loved that first event so much that they wanted to create more community out of it. Um, and she has made the space for that to happen and created new platforms for that to happen. And I have to say, like watching this thing develop has really just been uh, incredibly inspirational. So this is Ari Valenciano, and you are just going to be so pleased to know more about her. Thank you for being here. Hi, that was the most honoring intro I've had in a long time, so thank you. Very excited to be here and join you all. Um, so as I said, I'm Adi Malenciano, and I identify myself as a few different things from creative technology to artist to designer, um, all that was said earlier. And I'm going to use this presentation, it's a, a long amount of time that we have together to give a pretty solid background in the way that I approach um, technology and art and community organizing by giving my trajectory into this space and um, kind of the things I was thinking and the ways my mindsets have shifted. So to give context, uh, as was mentioned, I grew up as someone that identified as an artist in all ways and using any materials that I could um, and appreciated the ways that technology could allow me to create uh, art in different ways from digital illustrations for posters and graphics um, and kind of this visual communication and love technology as an artist but didn't feel comfortable approaching technology as someone that's doing the back end like I, I was much more comfortable being an end user as opposed to someone that was creating my own softwares and devices and that changed dramatically when I got to NYU and found this program called interactive telecommunications um, much like a lot of other programs where we're seamlessly merging art design technology together to kind of realize new possibilities. And so it was in this moment that I realized that a computer can also be a, an artistic medium. of You can express yourselves um, in creative ways using code and technology. And so through this, I was able to identify as much more than an artist that appreciates technology, but also a creative technologist, a designer, um, and all the things I identify as, uh, identify as today. So the way that I broke up this presentation is I'm gonna break up kind of the work that I was doing while in graduate school, because that's what most of this work is coming out from of the past three years. 
um, the work that I was doing and kind of how the work expanded as I introduced new themes. So I entered ITP as someone that loved technology or loved art, but also wanted to approach technology um, in creative ways. And in thinking about how I love to create um, illustrations, I would bring in my illustrations into code and then make them interactive. And these were kind of like the first, my first approaches to code of drawing illustrations and then making it so that as I touch different areas on my screen, it would relay different either visuals or music and kind of creating this um, MIDI interface with the digital screen-based interface. And then I was very interested in kind of expanding. How can I make my graphics move in relation to another thing that I love, which is sound. As someone that's always listening to music and um, wanting to create a relationship between the graphics that I was creating in creative code uh, with the sounds that were uh, playing in the room. So I would make these sound interactive visuals that respond to the music and that as the amplitude changed and the frequencies changed, the shapes and colors changed along with it. And in being a DJ, it's kind of hard to see here, but I would bring these visuals into the parties that I would DJ at. So not only are people dancing, but the screens are dancing along with them at the same rhythm and beat. So I wanted to get beyond uh, computers and screens. And as an artist, I loved how you could create things that are essentially and hopefully beautiful. But my approach to it was always, I want to make it functional. I don't want to make it just something nice to look at, but I want it to be an experience that someone else can um, create with. So I would create these sound sculptures where I would transform those sculptures that I originally created and infuse them with technology. So that as you uh, interact with it, interacted with it in different ways, it would create uh, music. And so this is kind of the process behind it of creating another sound machine using things like Arduinos and sensors and um, digitally fabricating the device. And this is the end result. And you can't hear it, but as I move my hand around different potentiometers, whether it's a soft ribbon potentiometer or a linear one or a photo transistor where I'm exposing different levels of light, that all relays into different um, frequencies and sounds. And I was developing this while in a course called New Interfaces for Mus Musical Expression. So that was an invitation for us to think about the way that we create instruments um, and be more, interact be more innovative in the way that they're created and not kind of use standard guitars or pianos, but instead use the ways that we have technology, the emerging ways that technology can kind of realize new forms of performance. So I planned out kind of what I want the space to look and feel like. Um, so for me, I love any opportunity where I can create any, every little part of the experience. And so I wanted to create my machines, my instruments, I mean, my um, costumes, the visuals behind me, and all of that, all creating this um, feeling tied to the work that I was doing. So I was very inspired by Jimi Hendrix and his kind of overall aesthetic of the guitar and just this funk and coolness. And so I definitely wanted to have a guitar in my hands, and I would um, prototype that and use a lot of different materials from wood to things I would find at Canal Plastic and sensors um, and created this sort of neo-electric guitar where there were no strings but it's all buttons and the potentiometer, the linear potentiometer is kind of what would be most similar to a standard guitar string. And then as I showed you in the video before, creating this drum machine using a bunch of different um, sensors and all with the Arduino to be the brain of it. And then this was the final performance of creating this space and designing the costume and everything about it, um, of just all this hyper kind of sensory of a lot of visuals and music and set and thinking about all the people that have inspired me and kind of making this one cohesive visual for people. And so I was also moving beyond just using kind of these uh, technologies that are maybe harder to ac access. And I wanted to think of how can I use everyday material and make those technology pieces in themselves and make them interactive? So I would make little felt drums um, using copper tape and attaching it to a microcontroller. And then through that microcontroller, I had a whole bunch of sound stored. So as I touched different parts of this drum, very handmade, um, everyday material kind of drum, it would relay different um, sounds. And also thinking about how I always want art to be functional. And so thinking, about the design of the instrument and making it kind of an art piece in itself if it wasn't attached to microcontrollers, but then also functional in that as you touched it, different sounds would happen.
So a lot of these that I'm showing you are very quick prototypes that I built. Um, and just to show different ways of thinking and using technology. Another uh, thing that I wanted to approach was augmented reality and how it's a potential to be a sort of experimental form of pedagogy. And for me, I love studying different artists and who's inspired them. And so I wanted to create an experience where if you show that artist's face to this augmented reality application, it would show, then show you different artists that they've inspired, been inspired by. So Jay-Z would show that they've been inspired by Nina Simone and Biggie, all on this cube that overlays on top of their image. But I was also thinking about being a DJ and how we've moved from doing vinyl controls of DJs, of mixing vinyls together, um, and then moving into this kind of digital controller where there's no vinyl. But then what if we could continue this innovation and use image targets, and that's what's controlling the music. So I would create this uh, AR DJ application where as you show different images, it would play the music and it would also play the music video that went along with that image. Um, and I came into ITP with the dream project, and this was actually my thesis project. Um, thesis, the Africtopia was another project that I worked on while at the same time developing my thesis project, but um, I loved photography and the opportunity to document your environment around you and um, how convenient and fun it is with digital photography, but then got pretty bored with the way that digital photography is so much you see what you get. Um, and wanted to explore with film photography and that it was much more experimental and the aesthetics of the camera were, much, uh, were way more beautiful than digital cameras. Um, and the experience of developing the photos I enjoyed. And then I moved to instant photography, but all of it, the film and instant photography became pretty expensive. But I generally wanted to explore new ways that we could use technology to reinvigorate the photography experience. So I started off with the, a screen-based interface and presented this at Maker Fair in Queens. Um, so there, people were able to engage with it, and I used processing to create this kind of fun graphic. But I always want to go beyond the screen and how we can feel technology in our hands. So I decided to create my own uh, hardware camera, and I was inspired by analog cameras like the Argus C3, which is heavily inspiring the aesthetic of these renderings. Um, but also thinking if we have the power to understand technology and the different ways that we can use it, why not go beyond the norms and create a camera that has an entirely different shape and hopefully it'll become iconic and that people will quickly recognize it. And then as I built it, I would do a lot of ergonomics testing. So as we build things, it's important to understand how does it fit in people's um, hands and bodies. And so testing out different shapes using cardboard uh, as the prototype uh, material and then putting it into laser cutters and cutting all these different cameras out and then thinking about the overall experience because my idea was I want to create a camera that's the best of all these worlds. It's a digital camera and that it's convenient and fun but it's also a film camera and that it takes you out of the moment and allows you to live it and instead of how iPhone photography you are so perfectionist with it and you your friend might see the photo and ask you to take it, take it again. Um, so if there is no screen, how are people going to experience the photos that they take and kind of um, making the experience of developing your photos, putting that into um, an app. And so you, it's the cloud that develops this photo. And also thinking about what if this camera could be complementary to someone's outfit? Why does it have to be this um, typical black or silver box? Why can't it be something that's filled with patterns and colors? And so I'm coming, I was building this as someone that didn't understand code very well. I struggled through physical computing. But with this project, it was, for me, the most important project I ever did and that it taught me that I, all of it is possible once you know the things that you need to, that once you know what to ask for, once you know what to ask Google um, to get help with, you're able to build anything. And I think um, I'm especially appreciative of the education I had before this, of learning enough of the foundations to then go off and learn a lot of this myself. So I titled the camera Ojo Oro, and that it's a line of experimental cameras that allow people to realize their golden eye. Ojo Oro is Spanish for um, golden eye in English. And so it's a tool that's meant to be experimental and fun um, and get people away from, from perfectionism. There's no screen, um, very colorful and all sorts of shapes. All of these were prototypes, so there's no uh, solid encasing. But thinking about how uh, patterns and colors can all exist in technology. And then these are the photos that it would release into the cloud. And so it would take a photo digitally, and then I would create these film-like filters 
um, and it would immediately be applied to the photo and randomly so that it creates this fun experimental um, output. And then um, it would send it, it didn't, I didn't make the app, but I paired it to Twitter, and so it would send the photos instantly to Twitter and also did GIFs. So I was thinking a lot about art and technology at the time, but then I wanted also to bring in culture and just my love of black culture and ways that I could make room for it in the creative tech world. So using that similar technology and building the camera, I created uh, a photo booth for our African American History Month at NYU and or Black History Month um, and use a similar technology both in building the camera. This time I used a CNC machine as opposed to a, a laser cutter and that I wanted to create a more durable um, machine with thicker material. And then I would make it so that as you pressed either photo or GIF, people would get in front of the uh, photo booth as a normal photo booth operates and then it would um, randomly apply different black notable figures as opposed to um, random film-like filters. And I was also thinking about data visualizations and music and how so many of us, I don't know if you all have, but I grew up watching music videos all the time and loving the aesthetics and the ways that the lyrics were transformed into something you could visually experience. And so I wanted to see if there was any sort of correlation between the lyrics that artists would right and the calligraphy of the colorography of the music videos that the cinematographer decided to use um, so i would study different artists like jay-z kanye j cole and and uh, study their lyrics and see the semantics and rhetoric that they use and see if that those similar rhetorics were used in the choice of color of the color psychology of how blue is traditionally associated with sadness Purple royalty, it's hard to see a correlation there, but kind of just a fun way of approaching data visualization. Um, and this was in thinking about the Obamas who had just left office and a way to immortalize them. And I don't know if anyone knows of Twitter bots. Does some of you know of Twitter bots? Twitter bots are these mach like uh, tools that people create through Twitter and that they will automatically send out tweets without someone manually typing it. So they'll create a whole database and they'll say every 24 hours tweet something related to something or every time someone tweets you tweet them back something in my database. And I wanted to create a tool where you could have these kind of conversations with uh, Barack and Michelle Obama that would immortalize their existence in our lives um, and they would whenever you tweeted at them they would tweet back at you something they've actually said but I would add in colloquialism to make it um, more informal. And another project that I was thinking about as far as culture, for me, this was also a time where I was thinking a lot about the technologies that we're using at ITP. It's great, it's fun, but it's, all, it's very powerful in ways that can be harmful. Um, and it also has the potential to uplift so many people and voices. So I was thinking about how I was in this space of being a creative technologist and enjoyed all the things that I was learning. It was a space I had always wanted to be in. But it was a space that I never saw myself growing up. I didn't know I wanted to be in this. I didn't know that computer science could be this creative. And had I seen people that were doing creative, uh, computer science in creative ways, I probably would have been way more interested. But if I also had saw black or Afro-Latina women doing this kind of work, I would have definitely been inspired. So thinking about how so much of people's confidence and ability to imagine themselves in the future is stemmed in who they're able to see as examples right in front of them, I wanted to use technology to get in, get in that world and create opportunities for people to see themselves. Um, so I thought about Chrome extensions and how you can add these onto your browsers and they can change the way that your browser works. And wanted to create a Chrome extension, this is purely speculative, that would allow people to see themselves in whatever media that they're watching. So maybe you're watching a show on Netflix or YouTube. You can see yourself um, reflected by it allowing you to upload images of your family and replacing those faces. So I would think about different shows like Friends and Seinfeld, which are notoriously white, all white casts, um, and imagine what if they had black people in their shows, or uh, what if shows were entirely uh, black was similar, the stories would be very similar, so what would the experience be like? So I use different open source libraries like CLM Tracker, which is basically a tool that allows you to uh, map different faces on top of your face, and it'll be, it's very precise. And so I created this uh, prototype of 
with people opening up the camera and their computers, it would map on different faces of my family. So my nephews and my parents and my sister would all be mapped on their face that they selected in. So that was kind of the first step in creating a tool that would allow people to upload photos of their own family and watch shows with people um, that looked just like them. But as I'm building all these things, I also come from a place that's predominantly black. It's the DMV area, Maryland, DC. Um, and as I'm making my, world, my work and releasing it on the internet and I go back home for the holidays and witnessing my friends um, get excited about my work, but also feel like they're not capable of doing these things. And so for me, and entering a space of creative technology and being very intimidated in the beginning, but then realizing that it's not that difficult once you just know the right questions to ask, it became very important for me to find ways to release all this information for more people to have access to it. And universities can be so expensive, so why not use technology to democratize um, technology education? So I created a YouTube series um, in releasing all the different skills that I was learning from P5, JS to different um, technologies and would just show people kind of the creative world in using engineering and creative technology. So I would show the process and things like soldering and hand routers and CNC machines and physical computing and creating the different machines that I was creating from electrical engineering and just to give all the tools so that more people um, could understand all the different steps. <coughs> so now I was entering a space where it's, it wasn't so much about celebrating the positive parts of culture um, and of black culture and um, but being more inclusive of the politics, of what was actually going on, the critical race theory, the um, negative experience of being black in America, and using that material as work to build my work off of. So one of the first few projects in entering this new mindset was an interactive exhibition um, that I created thinking about critical race theory but using technology. So this is a very triggering image that I created but it was inspired and the way that I created it was I was sitting in my living room and I have on one wall a lot of LEDs that change the entire room's color and then on another wall I have my art, my visual art hanging and I was watching how the LEDs in that room changed the way that the art appeared. So if it was blue LEDs shining, the orange light would change into something more like green. And so watching that and seeing if I could use that relationship as a, a way to create an experience that would hide certain things and reveal other things. So when you see this kind of visual, and then I give people different glasses, um, all these different glasses have different colored hues on the lenses, and these different glasses represent different perspectives. So as we see something in the street in America, and really anywhere, depending on your background and social context, you'll understand the situation very differently. So I wanted to replicate this experience by giving people the same visual to see at the same time, but based on their glasses, they would have an entirely different understanding of what that visual is saying. So with glasses like these, you would see that racism is good, maybe for my oppression. And so these different glasses held per the perspective of someone that's of an oppressing group. So people that uh, are racist and marginalizing towards others, people of an oppressed group. So people that uh, experience racism and people that think racism is bad but they don't entirely understand how it operates. So people that believe things like I'm colorblind and showing the harm um, of all these different experiences. And the way that it was approached was by me creating this sort of uh, DJ turntable because I was also thinking about appropriation and how so many black cultures are extracted from their meaning and context and pain and poverty that went into building them. Uh, and made cool once they're uh, removed from black bodies and communities. So the way that people first experienced this exhibition was um, seeing this shiny iridescent turntable and then as they put the headphones on, the glasses on and turn the vinyl, the fake vinyl, it would then say different, um, show different, uh, you would hear different audio recordings or see different visuals that would create this experience. And um, around this time, I was also creating data visualizations more for politics. So I was, uh, received a fellowship from the processing organization to develop a, a, a project I've been thinking about further and thinking about how um, severe racial disparities are in criminal um, data and policing activity. So I would study different data sets and then create ways for people to understand these data sets in more visceral and uh, empathetic ways. So as opposed to using shapes and 
um, color to represent human lives. I wanted to use actual human um, aspects as the kind of representation of data. So in the second uh, image, it's talking about pedestrian violations and somewhere in the Midwest, um, and using feet as a way to represent the fact that black people are three times more likely to be stopped uh, for pedestrian violations or receive pedestrian violations versus uh, white people in that same community, even though they're a much smaller fraction of, of that community. Uh, and I started off first, and this is just to show the process of creating illustrations of faces, but as you build and you learn kind of the better ways to approach it, sometimes faces are too um, blunt or revealing. And I also wanted to be more intentional in the ways that I was using different aspects. So instead of just creating a visual and drawing shapes on it, I wanted to use different uh, things like um, it's joints, like marijuana joints or hair uh, barrettes to represent data as opposed to drawings on faces. Um, and this was another one using processing of creating a visualization, data visualization that talks about, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, the way that people select their public schools in New York City when you go to high school and how much of an experience, how difficult it, of an experience it is and that there's thousands of different high schools. You go through this pamphlet and kind of see what's the best high school for you um, and then you'll look at the clubs and say, okay, I like the school because maybe they have an advanced art club that I want to do. And then you get to that school and they, that, the catalog's completely outdated. They haven't had this club for years. So, and maybe the school is advertising that a lot of students feel safe in their schools, but then students actually say that they don't feel safe in these schools. So I wanted to create a, a tool that showed the juxtaposition between the language in these different catalogs and this actual student's experience. So, um, and then I was kind of tying these together because for me, I love being in a classroom and um, diff creating different ways of learning and engagement. So I would create these and being in a DJ and a visual artist, create kind of these experimental pedagogy opportunities where people are learning about critical race theory and black culture, but through sound and visuals. So finally, we're here of designing black features. This is kind of where I'm tying most of this up. Um, and so as I'm building this work, this is really not, uh, not all the work that I was building at the time, but I was getting sort of exhausted um, in creating this work and feeling like uh, being someone that's trying to champion black voice and uh, by, while, while being an artist and wanting to sustain myself as an artist, it was becoming very exhausting and I wasn't finding a good balance. So I started to think more speculatively of what is black culture look like in the future? If we're stuck in this period and people are telling us what our own culture uh, looks like and how we operate and how intelligent or lack thereof we are, what if I could create our own narratives using technology? And so this series was tied along with these kind of sound, sound sculptures that I was building of creating art pieces that are also interactive. But I was thinking about the future of black culture and I was also thinking about the subversion of respectability politics. And if anyone, I don't know if anyone knows of respectability politics, but it's kind of a way to universalize whiteness and to make it seem like that's the norm and that's the most professional way of being. And anything else in comparison to that is not professional enough. So I was thinking about do-rags and how I love seeing black people on the street wearing do-rags because for me it kind of says that this is who I am and it doesn't matter what you think. Um, and I love my culture and so I wanted to put these different black culture artifacts in different contexts and lights. So I would go to the beauty supply store and buy things like bamboo earrings, which are seen as, which are stigmatized as ghetto um, and unprofessional, and hair rollers, um, and infuse technology into them so that as you touch them, they would then relay different African drum pattern inspired music, so funk and disco. Um, and then I would also also braid like fake hair and make that also an instrument. And as you change the different Afro picks, those um, Afro picks also held data inside them of it would change the visuals that you would see on the screen.
while doing this, I was also thinking about, well, if I'm creating this work that's addressing race and politics um, and culture, and in this, already in this world that's merging art and design and technology so seamlessly, and I'm also feeling very siloed within my graduate program of it's so much, um, it's such a lack of racial diversity and ethnic diversity, and race is always this add-on, or I'm always in class and I'm the only one that's um, trying to speak up for how the technologies that we're talking about in class might not deploy well in different communities. It was important for me to finally create a space where we could come together. And that knowing that I'm not the only one, that there are plenty of us out there, but what if we all finally came together in one room and we talked about race, uh, we talked about technology, and blackness was at the center of it, and it wasn't the sort of add-on. And we could see each other and celebrate each other's work um, and build amongst each other. So. I proposed the idea to ITP, the program I was at at the time, uh, and they instantly supported it and gave me the space to host people, and we had a couple hundred people attend. It was sold out quickly. It was limited to the amount of um, space that ITP had, so 200 was kind of the max we could go, or a little closer to 300. And in the space, it was uh, discussion around data, policy, technology, culture. There were performances. Uh, screenings, a speculative dinner with 3D printed African space food, new media exhibitions, just all sorts of stuff for people to experience the ways that te technology and race and culture go hand in hand and that there's this world that's there for us. Um, and it was exciting, it was reinvigorating to kind of just be around each other and get to know each other. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I was also, this was the first one and it was before I was actually exhausted by racism, but after this one I became very exhausted and I would research a lot of different people and um, kind of see how they approach their work and understanding of race. And Toni Morrison's quote became so inspiring to me um, of she's, her saying that the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. And so no matter how much work I was outputting and trying to make more, more representational applications and show critical race theory and interactive exhibitions, it was taking a lot of time away from the work that I wanted to do as an artist of just purely creating beautiful things. And this burden that I felt of having to be someone that's championing the voices, and though I, I love doing it and creating impact, it was also taking away from the things that um, aesthetically I just wanted to do. So I started to think about this a lot, of how so much of social justice initiatives are designed to prove to people that they're worth it um, and are, should be treated in different ways. And so feeling this act, Activism exhaust, I started to, as mentioned before, kind of speculate the future, and a lot of it was tied to a conversation I had with a friend who had spoken at the first Afrodictopia, who was part of ACLU at the time and has now gone on, on to work at an uh, institution called AI Now. Her name is Rashida Richardson. And she was talking about how so many of us in the streets, as we're protesting um, social injustices that are happening, we are being very reactive and not getting ahead of what's happening and it's purely something happens and we go in the street as opposed to kind of designing these features that we would want to live in. So for me, I thought that was a perfect opportunity to also to continue being this person that's organizing communities and championing voices, but to also be an artist and visionary. So I would start thinking about, okay, well, what do I want the future to look like and what does black people, what do black people look like in the future? And kind of just as the way that our narratives have been designed by people that are not us, how can I design our own narrative? So um, these were very early phases of doing this, of creating 3D rendered characters and animating them and then creating spaces for them um, and kind of thinking about what does future, what do future spaces look like? Um, and a lot of this was kind of aesthetic politics and not rooted in an actual uh, action, but just creating an opportunity for us to see ourselves in different lights. Um, and then creating video art with all of this, and then in being someone who does a lot of audio visual work, bringing all of us together. So I would bring sound excerpts from James Baldwin and Sokley Carmichael and have these visuals playing. And again, it's kind of like this experimental pedagogy of a lot of things going on, but in some way you're learning about black culture and critical race theory and all of that. And so these are different forms of it. And I won't play that video. Um, so it was continuing to create visions for equitable futures and thinking about how tech can be used as an eradication of ignorance. So for me, I was thinking a lot about it's so easy for people to gain access to the cool parts of black culture, but what if before you were able to do that, you had to, um, there was a filter on all internet applications, and I titled this the Afronet of 
there was a filter and before you were able to watch a video of Jay-Z talking about, or a music video in relation to him, um, you had to go through a series of questions to make sure you understand the black politics. And then creating this sort of manifesto um, of this future world. And in doing all this practice, I eventually created a whole world that existed 353 years in the future. And it was during a residency that I invited some friends to come in and enter the space and think about what would you do 353 years in the future when racial inequality is completely abolished and we're living all, everyone is living equally um, in equity and sustainability in holistic ways. Um, and all of these things have happened in the past 300 years. I've went through kind of this whole timeline. And so putting them in this space where we're no longer being these black innovators that are creating work in response to whiteness or uh, injustice, but instead being creators that have an experience similar to a lot of other people and that it's absent of social injustice and purely self-fulfillment. And this practice, for one, it um, was liberatory, hopefully in, in some ways, and people expressed that they felt that way, but it was also frustrating to think about um, kind of the work you would create absent of something that's been so central to a lot of people's practice. And it was also reflective in that it gave people the opportunity to think about what are they doing right now that's contributing to the future. And so thinking from the future and working backwards, how are you acting as a citizen in ways that are championing more equitable futures? So I was approaching year two um, of Afrotectopia with a much different mindset of Afrotopia is not meant to be the space that's fighting for equity. It's because learning about equity and the way that our world has been created and this capitalist social order, I'm not sure if we actually want equity in that kind of world and maybe it's more of creating a whole new world. And it's also creating a space where we are um, not as a lot of other kind of traditional social justice practices where I mentioned before, it's kind of you identifying yourself in combat of whiteness. It's instead you identifying yourselves and being um, rooted in your own ancestral intelligence. So how can we create an opportunity for people to not combat social injustices purely that, but instead create a space for us to be speculative based on our own ancestral intelligence and knowledge and all the things that our ancestors have done before us. So that looked like a variety of different things. One, before I understood equity in the way that I do now, we were creating these anti-racist technoculture uh, manifestos for equitable features. And so that was an opportunity for people to, I would for one, give a presentation similar to this, but not really about my work, more of how the world has operated for 50 plus years in relation to public policy and a variety of different branches of knowledge like econ uh, economics and urban design, sociology and give, um, show a connection between all these different uh, areas of thought um, and allow them to see this thread of how it's always creating a, an opportunity for people, certain people to continue, to continue to be dehumanized and other people to be uplifted. And so showing these different relationships and how things like uh, housing segregation existed for black people to live closer to the warehouses and now today we are, in an era of same-day delivery service and Amazon, when they first uh, opened up same-day delivery service, they excluded all black, many black areas in um, some of the biggest cities. And their reasoning for that was that, and that it was too hard to get to those areas. But had a sociologist been in that office in that space where they were creating this decision um, and involved in developing this algorithm, they would have understood that it's intended for them to be on the outskirts, and that was where they, the only places they were allowed to. So making sure that there's not this dichotomy between technology and um, people and public policy and anthropology and sociology. And beyond that, it was also, if kids are our future and they're gonna be the ones that are creating the worlds that we're gonna live in when we're older, it's important to invest in them and in thinking about my trajectory of entering this creative tech space and being someone that didn't see myself ever, um, what if I could allow them to see themselves where, whatever age they're at? So. This uh, summer camp was piloted this past summer and it was free to New York City public school students and it was through Afrodictopia that I would create different pedagogy around how black people have existed and been innovat innovators in so many different ways from W. Du Bois data visualization, Sabodi speculative design um, with cities, entire cities and show them this at the beginning of the day and break down all the technologies that we can use today to create uh, versions of their work that are more applicable to what we're doing, what we're experiencing today. 
Um, and Aftertopia year two was two months ago, about two or maybe a little more, um, August at Google, which hosted us. Um, and again, it was a space where we're being more centered in all that we are and all that we have been, as opposed to defining ourselves in combat of a, another group of people. And so things that happened at this event were um, people like Ashley Jane Lewis, who presented on Octavia, uh, Octavia Butler and, and their work on slime mold and how slime mold was used as a tool to understand efficient ways of communities um, and their design. And it was also uh, very inspirational to kind of just community design in general. Um, Kamal and talking about all of her work through Sundance and all these different institutions and um, Netta talking about kind of the cybernetics of racism and just like different ways to think very creative and innovatively about how technology and race work hand in hand. And one of the most recent initiatives through Afrodictopia is creating this school of Afrodictopia. So when I was first presenting the summer camp, people um, closer to my age were very excited about that work happening, but they also wanted to have something for themselves, for their age, um, where they didn't have to go back to school, but instead could kind of learn the similar technologies that kids were learning through the camp, um, but for them. And so that was a matter of just assembling a bunch of people that were already in the community and asking them, would you be willing to teach courses about your own work? So we have Jackie teaching the value of your digital self and so how people can take ownership, better ownership of their data, to Lejeune, who just finished a residency at iBeam and creating these um, avatars, 3D avatars that are more racially inclusive, or Brad Mora, who has been working a lot in this kind of fidgetal, fidgetal um, scene of creating a relationship between uh, physical objects and digital and doing a lot of work in Cinema 4D. Um, and all of this, these classes are gonna be held next June, I mean next January, next year, at the beginning of the year. Um, and they're all free to people in the community. And so it's a lot of thinking of how can the resources that we have as a community make sure that other people have access to them as well. And so to tie it up, I'm, I'm thinking, I haven't had as much time as I would have liked since leaving. I graduated in 2018 and after that I was a researcher and now I've been a professor um, part-time at ITP and Pratt and doing a lot of work and kind of continuing to teach the, the uh, skills that I've been able to gain, but it's been harder to kind of create my own work. Um, but a lot of speculating and researching in relation to how humans have operated and how capitalism is designed and economics and all of that. Um, and some ideas that have been top of mind as far as the work that I'd like to build out is thinking about political leisure of how if capitalism is designed for us, for working class people to just have enough for them to live and um, feed themselves. What if technology, as opposed to it being used for their demise and that automation is one of the biggest fears of the working class of a lot of their jobs, we see it all the time of self checkouts and going in the airport and there's a whole machine designed for you to check your um, ticket. What if instead of it used as their demise, it's used for their empowerment? So thinking about how computer vision and automation and machine learning could instead be used to turn their uh, more rarer leisure activity into forms of political engagement um, or participatory muse museums. In creating art, it's easy to kind of just create these pieces and then um, put it in a space and demand that someone else just interprets it however they want. But there's not really a relationship between the ways that people experience it and what the artist has originally created. And so what if there were more ways to create these machines similar to the sound sculptures that are art pieces in themselves, but they're, they become different forms of art when people engage with them. And then being an, an audio visual artist and very interested in sound design, a lot of my work has gone into modular synthesis. And modular synthesis um, is basically a way to bring in different uh, tinier machines together to create a, a larger instrument, like a synthesizer, but completely uh, customizable. So that's something I've been building um, and thinking about how can I create an opportunity for people to uh, use visual language and translate that into sound. So creating different um, graphics and then using computer vision and automation to translate that graphic into sound with little devices like modular synthesis. So that's all I have. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Um, hi Ari, uh, so I'm Bethany and 
first, thank you for coming and giving this talk because that was amazing. Um, so I guess my question for you is, as a person who has been working so much in um, like black communities and empowerment, um, what's a trait that you look for the most when collaborating with people who don't belong to that community? Um, that's a really great question. Um, and I think it's, for one, it's a visceral thing you can kind of feel um, in the way that you interact with them and see if there's a genuine concern, like what's, what's there uh, ambition within this world. If I'm understanding your question correctly of how, how would I decide if I want to collaborate with someone who doesn't identify as black? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so I think it's for one, getting to know them and understanding kind of why they want to be in this space. Um, um, how would I decide? And seeing the level of work that they do. A lot of times you're put in a position as a black person to, and I've been in this position so many times of, you're expected to teach everyone everything in relation to blackness, as opposed to them going and doing research themselves. Um, so I think that level of initiative also shows um, whether someone's genuinely interested, because if anyone's interested in anything, they're gonna do the work to figure it out. Um, so it's, it's a lot of understanding the, the little things that they're doing um, beyond just asking to be involved. I don't know how to answer that question though. That's really hard. <laughs> Are you surprised by the response to the first Epitectopia? Um, it, I don't. I feel like not that much because for me and as an as an entrepreneur, whenever you're creating something, the first thing you learn um, is that you have to create things for yourself. And so, knowing how much I needed that space, um, I knew that other people needed that space as well. Uh, I think maybe I, I didn't know that it would, I definitely didn't know it would last this long. Uh, I felt like it would be a good project, like a lot of people would come and it would be successful in that way, but it's kind of been now at the forefront of any of my work and I didn't expect that to happen. Um, so surprised in that way, but knowing that people would appreciate this, not at all. I knew that there were a lot of us that needed it. Um, hi, thank you. Um, so. You're working on a lot of different projects. I guess my question is, how do you manage to like prioritize this work? And um, yeah, how do you how do you manage to work on all of these different projects at the same time? Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to master like balancing it all very well. Um, I kind of just do. Sometimes it's a matter of I have a grant for doing this project, so I'll put everything aside to do that, or I have a deadline. It's kind of, a lot of it's dependent on the deadline, but things like modular synthesis or those more personal projects, um, it's whenever I have the spare time, it's hard to answer exactly like how to manage it, but I think um, for me, it's always important to have a lot of different things going on because I just get bored so easily, and I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, so having different places to go to whenever I want to do, work on something else. But I also think um, I put myself in positions that allow me to kind of jump around a lot. So um, this past semester, I just finished a course called Designing Club Culture, and that was at ITP. So that was an opportunity for us to learn about the progression of black music um, and how it's inspired pop music pretty much everywhere, um, and audiovisual technologies and kind of new areas of leisure for people after the Second World War and being able to research all of that and then being in a classroom where I'm teaching and I'm watching what students are creating, it's creating an a space for me to continue doing the personal work that I'm doing and having kind of um, a space to continue it with other people. So teaching helps of kind of teaching the things that you're already interested in. I also I'm gonna be teaching a course called The Revolution Will Be Digitized, and so that's another opportunity to do more research on my own and then turn it into a classroom. Um, and residencies, all are places that I'm working on all of these projects. So I think just finding opportunity to give yourself um, financial backing to continue the work. So for me, I, I loved being a student at ITP, and I've just been constantly on a mission to find spaces that would allow me to do similar things as ITP. So um, it, 
it, it's, it varies for everyone of kind of their career approach, but for me, being a student is the most important thing always. And so even being as a, a teacher, I feel like I'm still a student and doing residencies, it's an opportunity to continue exploring. Hi Ari, thank Hi. you so much. This was such a great talk. Um, my name is Victoria and I had a question about your political leisure um, initiative that's coming up when you talk about designing um, visions for an equitable future and just thinking about in where we are in our studies right now, thinking about policy and ways to kind of tangibly think on the ground of affecting change, like what can you talk more about that? Or like, what do you see as the future of politically possible change for um, marginalized communities? What do I see as? As kind of the steps and tangible initiatives that we can also take um, to make those equitable futures um, more real. Through technology or it yeah, doesn't matter? Yeah, through technology or technology infused with policy. Um, I see that that's kind of a next step for you. So I'm just kind of, because that's kind of a new frontier as well. So it's like, what, yeah, what does that look like? Yeah, I think <clears throat> civic tech is a coined kind of phrase for that world of thinking about how tech and policy all go hand in hand. A lot of think tanks and all of those things are being developed. Um, if I'm understanding your question of how do generally people become more politically engaged? Or kind of how, where, where do you see that going for your next? Um, oh, for my work. Yeah. Um, for me, I'm doing a lot of research on history. So being someone that likes to speculate a lot about the future, understanding how people have operated for the past however many years, hundreds of years, has been the most important. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, like I mentioned earlier, equ equity. Like what does that mean in a world that I might not want equity in, um, and doing a lot of uh, analyzing on how different groups of people have operated that maybe haven't been as oppressive as the world that we live in today. Um, so studying the ways that they have organized themselves has been important to me, and I think a lot of reflection on history. Also, in relation to technology and um, policy, I'm doing a lot of research on the history of the internet and why is it operating in this way, and understanding the fact that the internet was created out of the military, um, but had a lot of involvement in counterculture movements at the time of the 70s, and them thinking about it as this techno-utopian kind of opportunity for them to use technology for their advancement, but how it completely turned around into this pure tool for surveillance, understanding what's the history of all the tools that we're using and how was it actually designed and not being kind of oblivious to that. Um, and I think understanding that allows you to get ahead of it, and maybe it's not entirely creating new versions of that tool, but creating entirely different systems uh, while you're operating in this world. So the main thing is a lot of uh, reading, just doing a lot of reading on different books and studying people um, and research. And I think that's the most important thing for all of us to do. It's so, I mean, I think about my experience as a black person growing up and having such a disconnect from the, myself and where I was and the world around me to the history, black history and ancestral intelligence. Um, and if I had understood that, I would have been able to do this work a lot earlier. So I think that applies to a lot of different people in different ways of just this lack of understanding of history. So I think in starting any sort of initiative or um, trying to understand how to uplift people, it's important to know where it all started. Hi, Ari, thank you for coming. My name is Dana, and my question is, I don't even know how to uh, say the question, but it's uh, this, uh, like the Afrotectopia group is dedicated for people who identify themselves as black minorities to come together and learn about uh, history and uh, technology and design and everything. How would you involve, if you were to involve, other people who identify themselves as a minority, maybe like Hispanics and Latinos, into this world? Or is it just for people who identify themselves as black and all the courses you say you were teaching? Um, well, Afrotectopia, it incorporates Latinos too. I'm Latina, um, so it's inclusive of people that are from African descent. 
And I think um, in studying movements um, and how social movements and countercultural movements have operated, people have tried, like with the Black Panthers Party, they tried to be more inclusive of different ethnicities and do things like the Rainbow Coalition. Um, and in some ways, it's effective. And it's something I think about a lot, too, of kind of there's so much we can learn from other people's struggles and the ways that they tackle different forms of oppression and getting us all in the same room would be impactful. But it's also important to make sure that there are spaces that are safe for people uh, to come together culturally and to not have to silence their own problems because someone else is speaking at the time, but instead creating a space where we can all just, we have a space um, where we all have the same shared we, we, none of us will always have the same shared experience, but we at least have the same cultural background. Um, and so I've gone back and forth a lot of thinking about how to be inclusive of other people's experience, but I'm also very dedicated to just the black experience in Africatopia. It's purely for, it's designed purely for people of African descent, but it is inclusive to people of all backgrounds to come and learn. But the people that are on stage presenting and the topics that we're talking about, it's all black people and blackness. Um, and I think some spaces like that just need to be protected and it's not about um, bringing in more voices, it's just creating that space for a certain group of people. Hi Ari, thank Hi. you for coming. Um, that was really great and very inspiring. Um, I was thinking about how you were talking about like the genesis of Afro Afrotectopia and how it seemed like it was kind of born out of necessity. Um, and it was also, or the kind of idea of like making space where none exists um, and the necessity for that. Um, and I was struck by how like on board with it NYU was when you suggested it, they were like, oh my God, of course. Um, and I think while we definitely like shouldn't underestimate the the power of of like communities making their own space. Um, I wonder if you could speak to like any resources or support that you wish you had had in your graduate program um, prior to um, developing Afrotectopia that you feel like were not there. Yeah, um, it's interesting telling the story of Afrotectopia because while NYU was very supportive in giving us a space and some financial backing. The reason why Afrotectopia existed was because my experience at NYU was so um, just racially it wasn't uh, acceptable. So um, I think Afrotectopia wouldn't have even existed if there was um, a, a more balanced amount of people of different racial backgrounds. And um, it's kind of a blessing in disguise in that because it didn't, now we have this thing to experience. Um, but the resources that I could have had were black professors. There were, there were no, now there's one. Um, but there were none at the time, or mentors in the field, or um, even just a space to kind of go and understand um, black history and culture in relation to technology, because it is this kind of universal whiteness. Um, so those things, of all the things that you would um, need to realize that y you are, your culture, and all of that is valued in a tech world, they were lacking, which produced that. If that answers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi Ari, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I was hoping you can speak more to your experience of, you know, um, as Afrotectopia is um, growing and organizing as you work more with um, partnerships like with Google, how um, the experience has been in terms of kind of avoiding that tokenism and justification politics in that space and moving towards that more like equitable, as you say, this is a space where we can embrace the core values of our ancestral intelligence. Because I feel like a lot of times when it becomes like this organization, organizing of spaces for cultural others, that when we partner with like more dominant groups that that tends to happen sometimes from the outside view, so. Yeah, and I think it, the sim answer will be similar to yours of um, Elspeth of that. Um, sometimes I'm, it, the tokenism and all that stuff, it exists, but for me and the way that I've approached developing Afrotopia, and I intentionally did it while a student at an institution like NYU is because I'm able to use all the resources that I can to create something for other people. So um, if tokenism is existing on their part, 
at least I'm able to bring all the resources that I have access to, at least the space is free and um, the support is there, where I'm able to do it for the people. Um, and it's kind of operating as best as you can within a system that's designed in the way that it is. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely something I'm thinking about all the time of just ways of fundraising and um, making this appealing to companies. And it's been much easier before when the focus was, okay, let's just create a space where we are empowering each other using technology and that's appealing to um, tech companies and that they want to have a better pipeline and an easier pipeline for diversity within their, um, their companies. But as I move into a space where I'm learning, okay, well, maybe it's not exactly a fight for equity. Maybe it's not exactly a thing that scales so uh, big and fast. These are things that are not exactly um, attractive to tech companies. And it's important to make sure that, that, that I on that mission, the mission for the people that I am attempting to serve is always at the forefront. Um, so finding creative ways to kind of sustain ourselves and so creating these things like a membership. So people that are coming into Aptectopia, they're financially invested in what we're creating and it's not so reliant on sponsorship and them paying. Um, but I think tokenism and all that stuff, that's just, it's part of the system that we live in for right now. Uh, and as much as we combat it, we also have to figure out ways to maneuver through it for our best interests. Thanks, Ari. I'm really inspired by this notion of creating futures that aren't reactive. Um, and I'm wondering how you bridge the work that needs to be done with this sense of a fresh start. Um, this is a lot of years in the future that you're placing your speculative future. Uh, do you spend time and energy trying to reconcile those two, or do you actually need to you know, paint a new canvas and start fresh? not bring all of that, in some sense, remedial work that needs to be done forward. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Reconciling where we are right now in that future world? Yeah. Um, I think in doing more imaginative work, it's important to not follow as many rules as exist today, to not like create rules that are completely um, against the rules that we have today for the sake of that, but to just go more um, intuitively what makes you feel good. What are things that everyone wants? Everyone wants a, a nice place to rest. Everyone wants to be around people that they love. Like just going into the more visceral things that we all want and need, starting from that and creating a space that exists around that and not around people um, fighting for more power and monetary gain. So I think um, it's not so much being reflective of what exists today, but it's more of just being more reflective in what our most, um, most humane needs are, I think. It's kind of just the, the practice of it. And then in doing that, I did the speculative practice um, before getting so much into history and doing a lot of research. And I think it's important for people to do that. And now, as we all exist and think about, okay, well, in what way can I contribute to creating a more just future and a future that all feel, people uh, feel valued in. There are different ways to approach it, um, but I think it's always important as designers and artists to create those visions. And um, if those visions are absent of research, at least having that vision um, is important, but it's also important to research. But I, what I've seen is people getting so into research, and it's something I've been doing, of getting so into research that it's hard for them to even begin speculating. And so when you come to events where, like I've, I've gone to these so many times, the technologists are talking about algorithmic bias and all of these different um, technological tools of oppression, and people are like, okay, well now what? And they have no idea what now is. And so it can be harmful to speculate without research, but it can also be very beneficial to at least have ideas out there. Um, and so I think that practice of kind of going more into just what do people want, what makes you feel good, and creating a whole world around that. Yeah. Uh, can I, I'll just add 
ask that. Um, it's, it's not exactly a question, but I think that what you just described is Alan's mandate for no prototype, no meeting, which is to say that you come with an idea, but something has to be made. And a conversation can't happen without the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, one of the things that happened at Afrotectopia that I participated in this year were all the co-creation workshops that were happening in that space, and the ways in which people were willing to be very vulnerable to one another around really difficult topics, one of which was mental illness in particular that I sat in on, where um, people did feel very safe to explore a very, very difficult topic together and that the co-creation felt very authentic. And so coming together with ideas to make something was a way of being in that space to say, it's not just the research, it's not just what we know, but it actually is putting something out into the world that we will continue to engage with. Yeah, you know? and I think that also speaks to just the approach to programming. So in this, the first festival was kind of um, very conference-like in that people are gathering and they're hearing a lot of different panelists speak. Um, but instead of thinking of, well, what is this world that makes us feel better, um, as opposed to the world that we just existed in following those roles, the second one was uh, maybe one technical panel, but it was really a fireside chat, but it was a removal of panels and doing more co-creating and doing more of collective conversations where it's not this hierarchical approach to pedagogy, but it's more inclusive and elevating as many voices as possible. So all of that translates in pedagogy and just economics and all these different ways, but it's uh, essentially thinking about what empowers the most people as possible. <laughs> um, maybe a little bit more about this kind of forced white professionalism, and I think you talk about it in your course, and I'm sure Mark does in his course. When that gets to being a professional artist, I wonder, um, if there's some dynamic, I mean, actually know a little about the politics and business of the art world. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your personal experiences um, there with regard to the way that um, people will expect creative people to behave. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, definitely something I think a lot about. Um, and kind of the way that art exists now, especially as a black person, it's much easier to get funding when you are creating stories around black trauma and pain um, because more of the people that are funding it are not black people. So they kind of want these stories in whatever reason that they do. Um, so it's something that I, I realized and became very uncomfortable with. And so for me, I started to think more about not using art um, in a way that replicates kind of these stereotypes and um, limited imaginations, but be more expressive. And it was also a big transition in me thinking about um, kind of what's my place as a black artist. And initially in going into doing a lot more critical race theory research, um, I got in this world and kind of method of, I need to be using my art uh, in service of my community. And as I mentioned before, that becomes very exhaustive and draining. And then I realized, and I would think, I, at the time, I would think that it's uh, a waste of time or um, too luxurious for black people to use their art in ways that are purely aesthetic and artistic. Um, and as I've gotten out of that and realized that all forms of art are needed and that all artists should be able to express themselves in any ways that they want. If a black person wants to make things about butterflies, they should be able to, because it's sustaining themselves artistically. Um, regardless of if there's funding for that or not. I think it's always important that there are black people and people in general that are moving the needle forward and culture forward um, and empowering people, but it's also important that we're not limited to a certain artistic practice um, has been the biggest thing for me. Thank you for such a personal answer. I bet there's a lot of people who would like to talk to you one-on-one. Um, <laughs> -on -one. So uh, I think we'll um, thank you so much for an amazing, amazing talk. <laughs>